Oh, good morning, good morning, good morning. How are you? It's a lovely day in paradise. The sky is blue. The soleil brie. The birds are all uh, sort of flying somewhere in V shapes. Well, I don't know where really because uh, unless they've come down from the Arctic because to be honest with you, I can't see the winter lasting much longer. We don't really have much of a winter in the southeast tip now. Today is a momentous day. It's a pivotal day. You could say a pivotal day. It's the day that uh, is 10 days from the day that the GDC acknowledges that they received my application to be a dentist. I'm going to find out today whether my, my lifelong wish to be a dentist is going to become a reality and it is lifelong because I qualified in 1981 <laughs> and that's certainly a lifetime away they hold my future in their hands or rather their stamps so I'm expecting some movement today as I said uh, the one thing you can rely on with the statutory authority is that they do hold themselves, you know, accountable to the same statutory obligations that they are so merciless with you about. So we'll have to wait and see. I uh, put the application in on the 2nd, they received it on the 3rd. They've told me that they received it on the 3rd and they asked me for the... Um, CPD for the five years running up to the third and therefore uh, so and then they say 10 working days so 10 working days I know what they mean is like two calendar weeks so the third plus 14 is 17 and it's the 17th of January today which has been a quite an interesting two weeks off to be quite honest I've done quite a few things that uh, you know I wouldn't have done normally cleared my desk scanned everything got my accounts off to the accountant by the way I mean in the time that they've uh, they've taken to just read my application form and uh, just check my maths on my CPD. <laughs> I've claimed the right number of hours. They've uh, my wife applied for a passport, and uh, actually she applied after. I think she applied after I applied. Certainly after the third, anyway. And she didn't have to go to a photo booth and get a physical photo taken. She. I took her photo with my mobile phone and then we uploaded it online to the uh, passport office and made payment online and then um, they sent her an email saying that and then she had to send off her old passport because they won't you know they won't give you a duplicate unless you they can nullify your old one so they've she sent them the old one by post they acknowledged it by email they then said that uh, they've received her application acknowledged by email. They then um, <coughs> told her she'd been approved by email. And then this morning she got an, uh, an email saying her new passport's in the post and, and will be arriving shortly. So that's it. And there's still not a dicky bird from the General Dental Council about my, uh, my poor long suffering patients who have had to cancel another week's worth of. So, anyway, it's, uh, you know, I don't know whether you, sometimes you sort of wake up and you know that some days are going to be significant, don't you? I've just got that feeling about today. I just feel it, you know, it's just a funny feeling, feeling in my water that, uh, you know, there's just too many things. There's too many threads coming together in a knot today passport getting delivered, the GDC uh, deadline for dis uh, a decision, um, oil is being delivered, I'm getting some new gas oil delivered at home, 
what I, I mean you know it's of course I mean I won't pretend that if, they, if there's a problem it won't then escalate it's going to escalate into a whole new level of problem you know so I don't like to call it a disaster or a catastrophe or anything because it's not I mean again a diagnosis of cancer would be a catastrophe or disaster but it's you know and I've always said just work the problem you know they want to uh, they want you to fill in a 23 page application form fill it in if they want you to fill it in in black pen fill it in in black pen if they want you to send the CPD send the CPD if they want you to tell them in exactly which month you read which book then tell them and then uh, I have emailed them a couple of times, a couple of times they've written back and said like it's going to take as long as it's going to take, which is 10 days, I think they say we do aim to consider, we aim to consider, that's, uh, that's uh, weasel words isn't it, some folk tongue language, you know, we aim to be the best, we know we're never going to be, <laughs> and we can't, but that's what we aim for, you know, <laughs> we aim to be the best. Well, we're nowhere near it, but we aim to consider everything within 10 days. Yeah, that's fine. That's an aim. You know, and don't, and again, don't look at what people say. Just look at what they do, yeah? I've emailed them a couple of times. They've emailed and said, like, you know, 10 days. They're not rude. They don't say, look, matey, the more you email us, the less time we've got to actually consider these bloody applications. Although I'm sure that's what they think, but their emails are pretty—they're uh, pretty curt. And uh, the last one, I said, you know, look, do I need to cancel another week's worth of patience? And I didn't get a reply to that, so they've actually stopped replying to me now. And even the reply, they say we aim to reply within two days. Although I think that, you know, if they if they think that they can reply by return, they will reply by return. But the point is that if they don't want to reply by return, then they got a couple of days to sit there and, you know, sit on it. And it keeps the number of emails go down, doesn't it? Because, you know, if, you're, if they're replying by return, you could, in theory, you could send them two dozen emails a week. Whereas if they say, oh, no, it takes two days to reply, they can cut you down to two or three emails a week, can't they? Five emails a fortnight. So that's, I think that's sort of manageable from their point of view. Especially when they've got all these pro forma replies. It's not like they, you know, I mean, I think like the first sentence is, is they actually type that in and then they tack on all this other stuff about, you know, statutory, blah, that, you know, etc, etc, etc. All the boilerplate stuff that they, they put in. I mean, I'm not saying I don't use boilerplate, but I don't, I don't use boilerplate unless it's useful, and I don't use, um, and I don't send it twice. You know, if someone emails me and I see that they've had the boilerplate reply and they're they're asking about something else, then I do the courtesy of you know actually addressing their actual question and not just and sort of send him another boilerplate reply, which sort of, which sends out the message, look, you know, it doesn't, all right, mate, it doesn't matter how many times you email us, you are still gonna get this reply, okay? Can I just make that clear? This is our standard reply, doesn't answer your question, but it is what you're always gonna get. So, today's the day. And, uh, I'm still going into work. Because I think, you know, from a morale point of view, I don't, you know, you don't want the, the staff just sitting around doing nothing. Although there was, there has been another dentist there, so it's not an hygienist. So it's not as though they're not doing anything, you know. So. But you know, it's all for, I mean, there's no end of loose ends. I mean, what happens if you're a dentist and you own a practice and then for two weeks you cease to become a dentist? I mean, during that two weeks, do you, do you own the practice? Are you in breach of the law in owning a practice and not being a dentist? Not being a registrant? I mean, what, you know, this is what, this is the Cardiff University hack, isn't it? 
where the uh, university says uh, we uh, unfortunately we forgot to apply for a license to issue dental degrees so for a couple of years it would appear that we've been uh, awarding dental degrees and um, with no statutory authority to do so and, and the GDC is like oh well uh, okay Cardiff University don't you worry we'll, we'll just apply just apply and then uh, what we'll do is we'll say that technically everybody who graduated is wasn't wasn't a dentist but we won't prosecute anyone who's been practicing dentistry for it's been in the VT scheme for two years thinking that they were a dentist or got a or, or and we issued a number to you know we issued we gave them a number we registered them we put them on the register we shouldn't have done technically because technically they weren't actually you know uh, qualified they weren't they they'd qualified from a, an institution that wasn't uh, didn't have a license to issue qualifications but you know you you made a mistake we made a mistake let's just uh, <laughs> they've been taking some tips from the UK Foreign and Commonwealth Office about how to deal with Saudi Arabia you know just uh, we don't want that uh, we don't want all that you know all that dirty washing we'd rather that didn't all come out you know let's just let's just forget that and then what we'll, we'll backdate everything two years don't you worry you know so and the uh, the uh, you know the CPD the CPD changed on the 1st of January so technically Anyone uh, putting in any CPD from the 1st of January onwards has to have like a personal development plan. And they wanted my uh, they wanted my CPD to the 3rd of January. Well, I mean that that is difficult, isn't it? That's a bit of a problem, isn't it, for them? Because that includes three days under the new regime and uh, four years, 362 days <laughs> under the old regime. So what they've done, I think, and I don't know, because I don't know, but they have, um, you know, but I didn't, I haven't done any CPD uh, since the 1st of January, you know, quite understandably, because I think it was a bank holiday. <laughs> the second was also a bank holiday, if I remember, or no, the second was the Tuesday, wasn't it? First day we were technically back at work. So I didn't do any CPD that day. So, uh, what do you do under those circumstances? You know, turn a, we turn a blind eye to the fact that three of those days, or two of those days, perhaps I should have had a personal development plan for those two days. You know, what do you do? How far do you take it? But can you, or, or do you just ignore that and just sort of backdate the scheme to say, no, we'll, we'll, we'll do it under the old system, you know? And yet, and yet you've got this thing with the uh, ARF where they won't, you know, if you pay on the first working day. And I think you should. I mean, it's like the Dartford Tunnel, down here in the Dartford Tunnel, right? They used to have it so that when you went through the tunnel, you used to have to pay by midnight of the day that you went through the tunnel. And that's just not possible. It's just not, so many people were saying, no, I didn't realize that I had to pay like the same day that they gave you until midnight on the following day. So so supposing you're driving from Land's End to John O'Groats and you go through the Dartford Tunnel, where, and you would have to be pretty lost, I mean, I do admit that, to go through the Dartford Tunnel on that journey. However, if you're on a long journey and you went through the Dartford Tunnel, you might not be able to get close to a computer and go on the internet you know and type all your details in and remember your password and everything to pay the toll so they gave you until mid mid midnight the, the following day and I think you know it wouldn't be unreasonable for them to give uh, dentists until midnight on the first working day of the year to pay their AR life and I know what you're going to say, and what they're going to they'll say. Oh no, but it's a statutory obligation. The date's set in, the date's set in the law. But then there's so many dates are set. The date that Cardiff University's license to issue degrees was set in law, and it and it ran out. And yet they turned a blind eye to it. And a massive, a massive thing like that, a massive thing like that. You know, almost so so massive that they had to turn a blind eye to it. You know. It's the little people that don't get a blind eye. The bigger you are, the more likely it is 
<laughs> someone will, if you do something really, really terrible, someone will have to turn a blind eye to it because, you know, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be beyond their scope to uh, to rectify it without without causing ripples in the space-time continuum. Anyway, <clears throat> ten out of ten. I've got to say the GDC for trolling me the other day and getting me uh, out to, in the pouring rain and the hurricane to go to uh, the post office in Canterbury to pick up a letter telling me that I hadn't paid my ARF. I've got, you know, I'm really, I'm still laughing about that. I think that is, that is brilliant. That is, they could not, if they tried to troll me, they could not have done it that brilliantly. If they'd actually tried to organize that. I don't think this time, I don't think they're gonna, you know, I mean, I'm hoping I'm gonna get an email today because you get an email saying, okay, you're all right, if you pay up, if you just pay up, then you're on. Um, if I don't get an email today, I'll have to give them a ring and ask them what the hell's going on. And I'll be able to use the 10 days as a sort of, a, you know, to force them to give me some sort of feedback. And, um, worst case scenario is I don't get an email today but I get a letter in the middle of next week telling me that there's been an irregularity as I say the only irregularity was that the fact that I did a whole day's worth of CPR training and only got eight hours credited for it and they like to see ten but again that's you know if in the whole scheme of things my application fails on that one thing then you know, I don't see, all you can do is as much as you can do, you know what I mean? You can do, I can't change, I'm not going to lie about how many hours I got credited and I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to uh, invent, you know, two hours or forge a certificate or something, that's it. Once you start adjusting, you know, acting dishonestly, then, then that's it, you're sunk, you know? Not having uh, ten hours is, is one thing. And a very small thing, I think, considering I've got the certificate, but uh, that shows that I'm fully trained. I'll just have to tell them it was a, an accelerated course, a concentrated course, which it was. I mean, it was a proper course. We'll see. If things go well, I'll tell you, and if things go badly, I'll tell you as well. All right, wish me luck. I mean that, wish me luck. All right, bye. Later that day. Da, da, da. It's uh, about one o'clock. I've actually had the email. The email says that, uh, you know, once I pay up, then they're going to finalize the application, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't really say when I can start working again, so I assume that now the application's been approved and payment has been requested that as soon as payment has been made then uh, I'm good to go so reception has been notified to all stations or action stations I've now got to try and do between the 17th and the 31st of January what I would have done between the 3rd and the 31st of January still that, in my practice, that actually is, is not, you know, for me, for my practice to be like really, really busy is actually quite unusual. So, I can, I could easily. I mean, you're bearing in mind you're talking to someone that grew up in the 1980s on the National Health Service and seeing like 40 patients a day was not unusual. You know, it wasn't undoable. Uh, bearing in mind, well, we used to count the crown as four, so like a checkup would be one and a filling would be one. Or if it was a big one, possibly two, and a crown prep would be four. And then when we totted all the patients up on that basis, then if we had 40, around 40, or let you know, like 35, 36 to 40, then we knew we were going to be okay work work wise. So nine crown preps or 36 checkups. Anyway, I'll let you know how it goes. It's going to be tight at the end of the month. It's all about cash flow, isn't it? Really, it's just a case of whether the patients who are coming in need enough work really or whether they if they all come in and have checkups and say yeah I'll get that booked in the next couple of weeks then that'll take them into February 
so that could make the end of January a bit tricky but uh, this is what being a small business person is all about you know getting an ulcer you're not really if you're not getting a duodenal ulcer then you're not doing the small business thing right like we don't have enough trouble you know like we don't have enough problems without having to work around all the I think for businesses with five or fewer employees honestly I think there should be massive massive exceptions there should be all the staff should have their pensions paid for by the state or the uh, staff shouldn't have to pay the, you shouldn't have to run a payroll I don't think if you're a, a bona fide business with five or fewer employees I think the employees should be credited with their national insurance I think that uh, you know or some sort of uh, or there should be some sort of flat rate payment that you just have to make per employee so that you don't have to run a payroll you can't you know your the, the micro uh, businesses are effectively squeezed out by the legislation which is handled quite easily by the much larger enterprises your basic your corporate body your IDH or your southern whatever is going to uh, have no trouble at all doing payroll because they'll have a dedicated payroll department whereas for a, a dental surgeon with five or fewer employees then he's either going to have to pay to get the accountant to do it or do what I do which is get QuickBooks and do it yourself QuickBooks I found to be quite a competent program I wouldn't say it's exciting but it does do what it says on the tin which is basically record you know, all your um, incomings and outgoings and everything and sort of put them together in some rudimentary balance sheet and profit and loss account so you can get management accounts out they're not accurate to the penny unless you need to be an accountant to put in a bunch of uh, journals to make sure that it stays accurate it's not it doesn't do like uh, accruals and uh, things in real time it can do I mean you know if you know what you're doing but I don't I mean I've used it ever since it came out and I don't have the expertise to do that it's uh, it's a bit like Excel spreadsheet you know you're you there are three levels of <coughs> competence aren't there or four with spread with Excel spreadsheet there's being able to use it to do the basic formulas the multiplication the, the replication perhaps use the dollar sign to have a maintain a, a constant reference rather than relative reference that's number one and then the next stage up is to use it for uh, uh, mail merging and stuff like that and then the next stage up is to start using things like pivot tables and then the next stage up is to um, use it use the back end you know the programming languages and start doing XML scripts and things like that um, my level of expertise with XML is equivalent to you know is, is I can put in a I can reformat a date let's put it that way if, it, if I put in the 10th of January and it comes out as 110 18 I can I know how to go behind the scenes and make it appear as 10 JAN 2018 and all that and I can do mail merge but and I can I'll push I could probably do a pivot table but you know don't do any, enough of them really to bother and I certainly wouldn't bother to program because that's the professionals but uh, junction of death. Here we go. Saved from death again. So I'm going to go. I've been in. I've uh, rewritten all the uh, staff contracts. That's quite a good. There's a, there's a tip, right? If you're doing a lot of staff contracts, what you can do is you can have one staff contract, and then a separate spreadsheet that's got all the details in, like the job description and the address and the uh, date of started, etc. Hours of work, and then you can merge the spreadsheet into the contract. So that means that whenever you need to change the staff contract, you can do it, and uh, and then just reprint them all. Uh, easily without having to sort of cut, cut and paste, cut and paste, cut and paste into every single contract because then you might get like inconsistencies between the various 
contracts with the various members and staff. Not to mention it's a lot more time consuming. So, uh, done that. And then, had to have a chat with one member of staff who's on another contract to, that I inherited under the uh, 2P regs. And well, I want her to sign our standard contract, so basically I've had a chat with her. What I've done is, when I uh, bought the surgery and we had the money, they were all on quite low wages. So I bumped the wages up and I put them on two weeks full pay sick and uh, put the holiday up from four weeks full pay to six weeks full pay. And uh, it worked quite, quite well like that for two years or so, but we don't really have the income to justify that now. So. I've told them that I'm going to carry, I'm not going to put their wages down and I'm not going to affect the sick pay, but I am going to reduce the uh, the paid salary down from six weeks to four weeks. And that's because uh, I've got two part-time nurses and a whole-time receptionist. And whenever the um, one of them's away, the surgery's running at less than full capacity. So, um, I can't have, you know, we can only have one of them off at a time. And, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we can only have one off at a time and that means that we're running at less than full capacity for that week and then, so let's say one of them has the first two weeks of August off and then the other one has the second two weeks of August off. And then the third one has, say, the last two weeks of July off, and then I have two weeks off some other time. Um, it's, uh, you know, then six weeks of the year, you're not running at full capacity, then plus you've got uh, Christmas, you're off for a week, and uh, Easter, you're off for a week, you know, it all adds up, so. Anyway, I'll, um, I've got to drop something off. I'll, um, I might have a chat with you in a minute. All right, bye. Right, okay. Holidays, yeah. So, I do try so far as possible to pass on to the staff the benefits of, uh, you know, being in a successful dental practice. Uh, but uh, you, hope you can't be frightened if things go the other way temporarily to make the same decisions in reverse. You know, it's all lovely, isn't it, to give everyone a two extra weeks paid holiday and it's not so lovely to be the person who takes two weeks paid holiday away. The way holiday works is that everyone's entitled to 28 days, right, which is, but there are eight bank holidays, so, and they're all mostly on Mondays, apart from, uh, you know, sometimes the Christmas holidays fall on a Friday, and obviously Good Friday is always on a Friday, Word to the wise, it's always better to, if you're working in a part-time job, to choose to work on a Monday, because what happens is you get paid to work on the bank holiday Monday that you don't have to work, plus you get uh, paid to work on the Mondays anyway. Uh, anyway, that didn't quite come out right anyway. But the point is that you don't get paid uh, for any bank holiday Mondays if you don't normally work on a Monday. That's the best way to put it. Whereas if you normally would work on a Monday, then you do get paid for all the bank holiday Monday. So you effectively get an extra day's paid holiday, which somebody who doesn't work on a Monday wouldn't get. It's, it's not fair, and I don't know, that's just the way it's done. Uh, it's not fair, basically, that all the bank holidays are on Mondays. That's what it boils down to. But they are, and you know. So anyway, but that's not the point. The point is that, uh, You've got 20 days plus your eight days bank holiday, so you separate those up into 20, which is basically four weeks, uh, five days a week, assumed, uh, and that's the maximum. So if you work, say, six days a week, you don't get 24, you still only get 20, and uh, everyone gets the eight statutory bank holidays. Um, so if someone only works two and a half days a week, then, then they effectively only get 10 days holiday but that's still four weeks isn't it because two and a half days a week into 10 is four weeks oh, a bus don't see many of them around here 
So the other thing we've got in our contract, and it's a standard dental fusion contract, is that you mustn't take more than two weeks off together. And that's, um, and also, you know, that you, you're supposed to really book, I think they say 13 weeks in advance, which is effectively three months, isn't it? So what they're saying is, you know, you have to give three months notice of any holiday and it, and it has to be agreed. Now you might say, well, you know, how that's that's all pretty draconian, isn't it? And this member of staff is under the, you know, at your at your at your mercy with regard to when they can take their holidays. And then, but then that is the problem with working in a small firm. You cannot, if you're working in a big firm, there are certain benefits, and uh, one of the benefits is that uh, they can afford to be a bit more flexible about when they let you have time off. But in a small firm, you really cannot be all that flexible and. Uh, I'll be within my rights, I'm having two weeks off in June I think, or July, and I'll be within my rights to insist that they have those two weeks off and so that the surgery is shut because alternate, you know, in the alternative what's happening is that they're, they're all sitting around aren't they doing nothing and you're on holiday and of course they're getting paid and effectively they're getting an extra two weeks paid holiday because there's nothing to do. Although there is of course some reception, that doesn't apply to the receptionist. But, um, but uh, you know, with a small firm, you can't you can't be that flexible. And so, you know, if there are as there are only sort of four of us on the payroll, um, including me, uh, you can say to the staff, no, it doesn't suit the business for you to be off that amount of time or those particular weeks or something. And then they have to. They have to work around you, you know, you have to decide who's going to work around who, don't you? Is it up to you to work around their holidays or is it up to them to work around the time that they've got off? And really, it, it, it's the latter, isn't it? It's up to them to work around the time that they've got off. And I've got one particular employee who wants to go on a driving holiday around Italy. And by driving, I mean literally, she has this thing where she drives over there and she drives back and uh, they, she likes to spend three weeks doing it and uh, she's not that bothered about what happens to the business to be quite honest while she is doing it and I think she needs to be more bothered because uh, the, you know you're missed aren't you in a small business when you're not around if you're the receptionist or the implant nurse or something and you're not there then obviously you are missed and uh, business runs on less than full efficiency, and uh, it's not. And the business doesn't hire you to absent yourself from work for large periods, and uh, and just leave the business to cope. It, it's a tremendous privilege to be paid per hour. You know, I mean, I don't. I don't think I've ever been paid per hour in the sense that you know I've almost irrespective of what I've done when I've gone to work I've been paid the same amount of money I think that's a tremendous privilege and uh, it, it's don't I think a lot of employees don't realize what a privilege that is you know they but I've said to the staff that in the same way as I like to um, let them share in the benefits of the business when it's doing well they, they mustn't think that they're immune from suffering when the business is not doing so well and uh, that's, you know, I hope they understand that. I hope they don't think, because there is a certain amount of like sitting there fat, dumb and happy while the business goes down the tubes. You know, they do expect you to, you know, they, they can sit there knowing quite well, for example, that it's gonna be very, very tight at the end of the month as to whether or not you'll have enough cash in the account to pay the wages and the rent and the, uh, and, and the loan. And, uh, you know, my attitude is, well, when were you, when were you going to mention this? Now, when were you going to mention 29th, 30th, 31st, on the 1st, when your wages didn't go through? When were you going to tell me that you didn't think that there was enough money in the bank? You know, it's their responsibility. And if the uh, things aren't uh, going so well, then things shouldn't go so well for them. And I think they should understand that and not sit there and think, well, I, it doesn't matter because, you know, I... I'm entitled to 12 weeks redundancy anyway, so 
even if they got rid of me I'd have a wad of cash and in the meantime I can just sit here and clock up anything between 10 and 20 pounds an hour whether you know the dentist is working or whether he's tap or you know whether I'm working or whether I'm tapping my foot the other thing is I think also with saving money you have to understand something and this is something that Kevin Lewis told me once where we were at a Kevin Lewis lecture and it always stayed with me and that is that a pound saved and this is a Dickensian saying I'm sure but a pound saved is a pound earned in other words your if you add a pound on to your turnover and your expenses are 70% then you're going to end up with 30 pence out of that at the end of the day whereas if you save a pound then you're going to end up with a pound you know you're going to you'll get all of it because there's no expenses associated with saving expenses you get the full value so for every you know four pounds or five pounds that you could possibly add on to your turnover all you have to do is save one pound on your outgoings and it's I know it's always difficult to say well what do I cut off the outgoings but the answer is you have to cut off whatever's necessary you know to be profitable and offer a good quality service that's um, you know that makes money and where the staff are reasonably happy and have fun so also I mean if you're looking at cost savings it has to be done in consultation with the staff they have to understand why you're embarking upon this project um, you know and usually they will know you know it's not the practice is not you know it doesn't have so many patients coming in or if it's not but, what I'm stopping if it hasn't got so many sort of implants coming in or if uh, the uh, anyway for whatever reason if the staff will not they're not they're not you know totally insensitive to the way that the business is going so they won't be as uh, sympathetic if the business is doing badly because you're drawing out twenty thousand pound a month um, but you know providing you're not taking diabolical liberties with what you're drawing out then they'll understand and you have to talk to them get them on board explain to them that you're you know you're taking measures because of the circumstances and if the circumstances change then then there'll be scope to reverse or um, to undo those measures you know and especially if there's any sort of redundancy involved and, and remember it's not the person you make the redundant it's the job it's the job that disappears the person disappears because their job has disappeared it's not you know so you must always talk about the job being redundant and making the something something job redundant ne never the it's always the reception job that's being made redundant never the receptionist right And uh, you have to explore every avenue, you know, because when you're trying to save money, I mean, I, you can ask for suggestions from the staff, and what you'll get is, is a ton of stuff that they've already suggested which hasn't worked. Like, they'll say, well, I think we need to advertise more. So then you need you explain to them that, for a start, advertising is a slow burn in terms of, it, it relies on re repeated exposure, and it's not, uh, you know it's going to put your costs up at a time when you're trying to save costs um, more than bring in income because of this four to five to one leveraging and um, but then but the point is that you've given them the opportunity to have some input you know because then later on if ever it goes up you know in front of a third party for some sort of impartial assessment as to uh, how, how you carried out any redundancies or anything you have to be able to show that you were eminently reasonable and that you considered uh, cutting uh, hours, cutting staff, cutting even cutting pay, cutting holidays, cutting sick pay, uh, laying them off if it's in the contract, you know, uh, before, before uh, you started doing things like redundancies. 
So that's it. I mean, that's it. But that's the whole. That's the mark of a businessman, isn't it? You've got to manage the business when things aren't going so well, as well as I mean, anyone, any idiot can manage a business when things are going well. <laughs> but you have to be really quite a clever manager to um, manage a business when things are, are turning to shit. <laughs> anyway. I'm back. I started off by telling you they sent me. I'm back on the registers, so it's you know, it's darkest before the dawn. It's only darkest in here. This is the sun. Anyway, I'll um, I'll say cheerio and uh, probably talk to you tomorrow. Might upload a bit of this stuff now. I'm back on the register. All right. Bye for now. Bye.